Hello and welcome to Bay College's video lectures for Math 085 Pre-Algebra. This is section 4.9, Reading Graphs. Our objective in this section is to learn how to read the graphs and to interpret information from things such as bar graphs, circle graphs, line graphs, and histograms. The first one we're going to look at is a bar graph. Now, bar graphs are used to compare different categories uh, relative to quantities. In this example here, maybe we had a survey and students decided to vote for favorite fruits. And in this, we can see on the left-hand side from top to bottom is a list of fruits, beginning at the top with apples, bananas, grapes, oranges, pears, and strawberries at the bottom. On the uh, bottom of the graph, we see quantities of 0 through 5 from left to right, and that indicates the number of students who chose any particular type of fruit. So let's first take a look at bananas. If we look at the column of bananas, the second one from the top, we can follow over three spaces, and we see there were three students who decided that bananas were their uh, favorite fruit. So 3 is the quantity of that group that is labeled bananas. So another thing that we can do is we can ask, well, how many students answered the survey? Well, if we sum up the total of each one of these bars, we would have the total number of students. So if we look at the column of apples, we see there are five students who chose apples as their favorite fruit. Three students chose bananas, two chose grapes, four chose oranges, one chose pears, and four chose strawberries. And if we sum that column of numbers up, we see that there were 19 students who voted on what their favorite fruit was. So we can actually take graphs, such as bar graphs and other types of graphs we're going to explore in this section, and we can actually extrapolate and interpret a lot of information from a single graph. The next graph we're going to look at is another type of bar graph. Instead of having the graph's uh, bars go from left to right uh, in a horizontal fashion, sometimes we can uh, illustrate different information using a bar graph where our bars are uh, vertical. So if we look at this, here we have high temperatures for 2009. And we don't indicate the place, so we'll just assume it's uh, you know, any town USA. And if we look at this, we see, well, <clears throat> these bars, just like in the previous graph, have different lengths. And uh, if we look on the left-hand column, we see a series of numbers. Now, from bottom to top, it's 0 to the highest marking of 35. But the graph actually goes a little bit beyond that. And this indicates by its label the degrees C. So this is degrees cent, uh, centigrade or Celsius. And if uh, we look at the bottom uh, up column, we see a few months that are listed there. And we might notice that not every month is listed. And that's sometimes just for space. To actually write out every month, it, would, uh, it wouldn't fall under its appropriate column. So for space purposes, maybe graphs may omit some information. But hopefully, we have the tools and the previous knowledge that we know, well, I know the month between January and March, as an example, would be February. So <clears throat> if we want to read something from this graph, just like in the previous graph, we just have to find the column of interest, or the group. In this case, it's the months, and look at what number it corresponds to. If we look at July, we can see that that column, if we follow it over to the left, where we have our degrees Celsius, we see it's a little bit more than 35. So sometimes we have to estimate, because not every uh, integer is going to be listed. And I can see that each one of these integers is 5 apart. We have 0, 5, 10, all the way up to that 35. And this one is just slightly above that 35. So maybe I'm going to estimate it and say, well, the average uh, temperature for the month of July according to our chart here, is 36 degrees. And that would be an estimate, because it's not exact. Now, it asks what month had the highest temperature. And uh, I misspoke. It's not July. Uh, it's the month in between July and September. As we see from the graph, that month isn't listed. And uh, 
So we have to have that previous knowledge of what month is between July and September. And hopefully, we know that that would be August. So August answers this question, what month had the highest temperature in 2009, according to our bar graph? So we can, just to review, bar graphs uh, give us quantities versus categories or groups. And we'll see another similar type of graph towards the end, where it looks like a uh, bar graph, but it's actually called a histogram. And we'll explain the difference of those when we get to it. The next thing we're going to look at is a circle graph, which is often called a pie chart because it's round. It's a circular chart uh, that describes the distribution of a whole. It, you know, we all have parts of a whole. And uh, if we want to divide it up into different categories, uh, in this example, we have a circle that illustrates the favorite pizza toppings. Maybe a group of people were asked to uh, choose their favorite toppings, and then they were split into the four categories, as you can see on the right. And some uh, pie charts, or actually all pie charts, should have a key to them that explains what this population is, or what this part of the whole represents, or what another part does. And we can see we have pepperoni, cheese, sausage, and supreme as pizza toppings. So maybe someone was surveyed, and uh, a group was surveyed, and they were asked, well, what's, what's your favorite pizza topping? So from this chart, we can take information. So we're going to ask, what percent who answered the question prefer sausage? Well, the first thing we do is we look at that key, and we say, well, here's sausage. And the sausage is illustrated with an orange square. That orange square says the portion of the pie that shares this color represents the percentage of people who prefer sausage. So if we go to the chart, we can see, well, orange is represented by 15%. So 15% of the people liked sausage as their favorite pizza topping. So our answer is 15% prefer sausage. So that is the percent. So that's uh, essentially the basics of a, uh, a pie chart, otherwise known as a circle graph. The next thing we're going to look at is line graphs. Now, line graphs are used to show trends or behavior over a period of time. Now, in the uh, graph on the left, we see uh, it has a title, and it says Absent Days for Jim in Elementary School. And on the left-hand side of the graph, it represents numbers from 0 to 10. And it uh, has a label of the number of days absent. And on the bottom, we have a, quant uh, a quantity with a label of year in school. We have K and first, second, third, through sixth. Now, kindergarten is represented by k. And hopefully, you know, we understand that the next one would be first grade, second grade, so on and so forth, because it's your year in school, what grade uh, Jim was in when he had these absences. And the circles actually indicate the days absent. You can see that in the key on the right-hand side of the graph. Now, why do we use line graphs? Well, it, hel it helps us understand trends or behavior. And if we look at this, it's representing absences during elementary school. And we can see in kindergarten, Jim had three absences. And in first grade, four. And in second grade, seven. And if we just look over those three years, we do see a trend. And that trend is Jim is missing more and more days of school every year. Uh, between second and third grade, well, he had the same amount of absences, seven of them. And that's quite a few absences. And then in the fourth grade, uh oh, Jim had nine absences. Something's got to change. We can see that increase over those first uh, five years of his schooling. And then in the fifth grade, well, maybe he's uh, maturing a little bit. And he's wising up saying, hey, I can't miss any more school. I want to be successful. So he doesn't miss any days uh, in the fifth grade. So we can see that trend or behavior, in this case, absences for Jim in elementary school. And on the same page, on the right-hand side, we have another line graph. And this is on what's called a Cartesian coordinate system. It helps uh, illustrate uh, integers that are both positive and negative, uh, left to right and top to bottom. It's a Cartesian coordinate system. And that'll be introduced when you get to uh, Chapter 6, Section 1 will explain how to use those systems. But this also says you know, we can look at this and look at the trend of the graph. If we look at the purple line that's illustrated in that graph, 
we can see that from left to right, that line is going bottom to top. It's increasing. It's going up. So we know the behavior of the line or the trend of that line. And as you move on in algebra, you'll really concentrate on those. Those are called linear equations. And you'll learn all about the intricacies of those types of graphs as well. All right, and I had mentioned previously about a histogram, how it looks very similar to a bar graph. We can see these uh, horizontal columns. But when it, the difference between a bar graph and a histogram is a bar graph compares a quantity to a group. Now, a group isn't something that has numbers, such as bananas and apples and fruit. They don't have uh, a value. They have a description. When a histogram looks like a bar graph for the reason that it is very similar, except now we're comparing numbers to numbers, a quantity of one thing relative to a quantity of another. So it's defined as uh, being used to show continuous quantity comparisons. So numbers uh, increase continuously from left to right on a number line. And that's how we illustrate them on any of our graphs. So in this one, it has a question here. It says, how many times have you traveled out of the country? Maybe the people who uh, answered this survey, you can see on the left-hand side is the number of people who chose uh, or who identified uh, an answer to that question. And on the bottom of the graph, you can see the number of trips. So you notice we have a number of people versus a number of trips, a quantity versus another quantity. Uh, and the bottom illustrates you know, people may have gone zero to two times traveled out of the country. The next column would be three to five times, the next six to eight, and so on. Now, what if we ask the question, how many people surveyed have traveled out of the country more than five times? Well, the first column is 0 to 2, and the second column is 3 to 5. So those are the values that are less than, less than or equal to 5 times. And we've discussed inequalities. So hopefully, we'll be able to understand what the question is asking. How many people surveyed have traveled out of the country more than 5 times? So that would be 6 times or more. And we can see that graph actually gives us that information. But we might have to interpret it and pull some information on it. So I'm, at, I'm actually going to leave that for you to total up and find the answer to that question. How many people surveyed have traveled out of the country more than 5 times? This has been uh, Bay College's video lectures for Math 085, uh, section 4.9, reading graphs. Thank you for watching.